Hello, I'm reading you a really quirky short story today by surrealist artist Leonora Carrington. Um, it is quite short and it is quite quirky. It means that means that uh, it's gonna leave you quite perplexed, thinking, what was that about? Um, but please enjoy it and do let me think what your reaction was, what kind of perplexity did you feel? My Flannel Knickers by Leonora Carrington Thousands of people know my flannel knickers and though I know this may seem flirtatious, it is not. I am a saint. The sainthood, I may say, was actually forced upon me. If anyone would like to avoid becoming holy, they should immediately read this entire story. I live on an island. This island was bestowed upon me by the government when I left prison. It is not a desert island. It is a traffic island in the middle of a busy boulevard and motors thunder past on all sides day and night. So, the flannel knickers are well known. They are hung at midday on a wire from the red, green and yellow automatic lights. I wash them every day and they have to dry in the sun. Apart from the flannel knickers, I wear a gentleman's tweed jacket for golfing. It was given to me and the, the gym shoes, no socks. Many people recoil from my undistinguished appearance, but if they have been told about me, mainly in the tourist's guide, they make a pilgrimage, which is quite easy. Now I must trace the peculiar events that brought me to this condition. Once I was a great beauty and I attended all sorts of cocktail drinking, prize giving and taking, artistic demonstrations and other casually hazardous gatherings organised for the purpose of people wasting other people's time. I was always in demand and my beautiful face would hang suspended over fashionable garments, smiling continually. An ardent heart, however, beat under the fashionable costumes, and this very ardent heart was like an open tap, pouring quantities of hot water over anybody who asked. This wasteful process soon took its toll, its toll on my beautiful smiling face. My teeth fell out. The original structure of the face became blurred, and then began to fall away from the bones in small, ever-increasing folds. I sat, I sat and watched the process with a mixture of slighted vanity and acute depression. I was, I thought, solidly installed in my lunar plexus, within clouds of sensitive vapour, if I happened to smile at my face in the mirror, I could objectively observe the fact that I had only three teeth left and these were beginning to decay. Consequently, I went to the dentist. Not only did he cure the three remaining teeth, but he also presented me with a set of false teeth, cunningly mounted on a pink plastic chassis. When I had paid a sufficiently large quantity of my dis diminishing wealth, the teeth were mine, and I took them home and I put them into my mouth. The face seemed to regain some of its absolutely irresistible attraction, although the folds were of course still there. From the lunar plexus I arose like a hungry trout and was caught fast on the sharp barbed hook that hangs inside all one's very beautiful faces. A thin magnetic mist formed between myself, the face and clear perception. This is what I saw in the mist. Well, well, 
I was be I really was beginning to petrify in that old lunar plexus. This must be me, this beautiful, smiley, fully toothed creature. There I was, sitting in the dark bloodstream like a mummified fetus with no love at all. Here I am, back in the rich world where I can palpitate again, jump up and down in the nice warm swimming pool of outflowing emotion. The more bathers, the merrier. I should be enriched. All these disastrous thoughts were multiplied and reflected in the magnetic mist. I stepped in, wearing my face, now back in the old and enigmatic smile which had always turned sour in the past. No sooner trapped than done. Smiling horribly, I returned to the jungle of faces, each ravenously trying to eat each other. Here I might explain the process that actually takes place in this sort of jungle. Each face is provided with greater or smaller mouths, armed with the different kinds of sometimes natural teeth. Anybody over 40 and toothless should be sensible enough to, to be quietly knitting an original new body instead of wasting the cosmic wool. These teeth bar the way to a gaping throat which disgorges whatever it swallows back into the fetid atmosphere. The bodies over which these faces are suspended serve as ballast to the faces. As a rule, they are carefully covered with colours and shapes in current fashion. This fashion is a devouring idea launched by another face snapping with insatiable hunger for money and notoriety. The bodies, in constant misery and supplication, are generally ignored and only used for ambulation of the face as I said, for ballast. Once, however, that I bared my new teeth, I realised that something had gone wrong. For after a very short period of enigmatic smiling, the smile became quite stiff and fixed, while the face slipped away from its bonish mooring, leaving me clutching desperately to a soft, grey mask over a barely animated body. The strange part of the affair now reveals itself. The jungle faces, instead of recoiling in horror from what I already knew to be a sad sight, approached me and started to beg me for something which I thought I had not got. Puzzled, I consulted my friend a Greek. He said, they think you have woven a complete face and body and are in constant possession of excess amounts of cosmic wool. Even if this is not so, the very fact that you know about the wool makes them determined to steal it. I have wasted practically the, the entire fleece, I told him. And if anybody steals from me now, I shall die and disintegrate totally. Three-dimensional life, said the Greek, is formed by attitude. Since by their attitude they expect you to have quantities of wool, you are three-dimensionally forced to sainthood, which means you must spin your body and teach the faces how to spin theirs. The compassionate words of the Greek filled me with fear. I am a face myself. The quickest way of retiring from social face-eating competition occurred to me when I attacked a policeman with my strong steel umbrella. I was quickly put into prison where I spent months of health-giving meditation and compulsive exercise. My exemplary conduct in prison moved the head wardress to an excess of bounty 
and that is how the government presented me with the island. After a small and distinguished ceremony in a remote corner of the Protestant cemetery. So here I am, on the island, with all sizes of mechanical artefacts whizzing by in every conceivable direction, even overhead. Here I sit. <laughs> Please do let me know what you thought of this very strange surrealist story by Leonora Carrington. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. See you next time.